Welcome to the Guitar Shop Podcast, Episode 3, coming to you from Wade's Guitar Shop in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm Wade Stark, owner of Wade's Guitar Shop. On my right here, Alex Ballard. On my left here, Dan Hintz. We are coming to you for the first time in beautiful 16x9 widescreen format. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, this, uh, this, pod sh uh, this podcast covers all things related to a guitar shop, guitars, guitars, equipment, musicians, and the like. Uh, how are you guys doing tonight? Good. Good. Hey, good. Real good. Awesome. Uh, yeah, good. You guys got a couple stories tonight. Uh, we've got a few things we're going to talk about, and actually we're going to kick it off tonight with uh, Alex's story. This is sort of a follow-up to your story from the last podcast on tubes. Tonight we're going to take a look at what? Well, uh, there's these little widgets called yellow jackets that uh, turn your Class A-B amp into a Class A amp and cut your power and uh, cut your power down dramatically. Uh, and uh, so uh, we did some little recording with it, and it looked pretty cool. Okay. Um, what kind of amp did we use here? We used a early '70s Pro Reverb. What is it? A '72? '72. Uh, non master volume. Non master volume. Yeah, it's about a 40 watt amp, and we put two EL84s in the spot where the 6L6s would go and we made it much juicier at a lower volume and we got kind of a different more almost boxy sound out of it so it's pretty right. cool. Very cool, let's take a look at it now. Hey, uh, welcome to uh, my little segment here on our uh, Guitar Shop podcast. Uh, this week I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a little widget that uh, I got a while back uh, called a yellow jacket. The yellow jacket is just this uh, yellow widget right here. And this here is an EL84 vacuum tube. And what the yellow jacket does is it converts a 6L6 power tube as found in this little uh, early 70s uh, Pro Reverb Fender Pro Reverb amp. It has two 6L6s uh, for the power amp and uh, puts out I think about 50 watts uh, perhaps it's or it's 40 watts I suppose uh, and if you turn this amp all the way up it's going to be pretty pretty loud amp um, so one of the things that uh, this little yellow jacket jobby does is it um, it converts the amp from a class AB type of amp to a class A amp and I'll uh, give a little uh, technical tutorial on that later uh, and it converts a 6L6 into an EL84 and uh, uh, it also uh, scales the power down by I think uh, two-thirds or something like that. It's going to turn this amp into about a 10 or 15 watt amp is what it's going to end up doing. Um, wattage doesn't always equate volume but it's, it will reduce the overall volume of this amp pretty dramatically uh, which is going to be excellent for those of you who do home recording and have neighbors. Uh, this is a pretty loud amp even though it's only 40 watts it's a pretty darn loud, loud amp um, and so that's basically what uh, this little yellow jacket does. There's other companies that make a little converter like this. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool about it uh, is it's going to change the characteristical sound uh, of this particular amp. Um, we'll we'll uh, do a little a little guitar playing and we can hear it before and after. Um, but basically uh, a lot of your uh, Class A amps, um, when, when people tend to think about Class A amps, they tend to think about uh, well the Vox AC30, uh, which is a very very different sound from your classic sort of uh, 60s and 70s Fender uh, type of amp sound. Um, there's a lot of other Class A amps. Um, uh, I think a lot of the, the early Gibson uh, amps are Class A, and uh, I think the Fender Champ amp is, a, is an example of a Class A amp. Um, but uh, the uh, difference between a Class A and a Class AB amp, um, there's going to be a, a, a sound difference that we can hear. It's also going to allow us to kind of uh, uh, push the power tubes a little ha harder and get uh, some uh, power amp breakup, some distortion in the power amp section, and kind of a juicier overall uh, sound at a lower volume. Uh, so it's just kind of a neat uh, uh, little widget uh, that you can use to really get some different sounds out of a single amp. And uh, I think street price on these is probably about 30 bucks a piece, um, maybe a tad more than that. Uh, and then these tubes are probably about uh, 15, 20 bucks a piece. You know, so for the cost of uh, a couple cheeseburgers in Manhattan, uh, you can kind of get the vibe of a, a $2,000 60s Vox amp. That's kind of the idea. So let's have a listen to uh, what a, uh, a Fender Pro Reverb sounds like uh, with the Stratocaster 
uh, turned about halfway up, and then we'll turn it off and try these little widgets and uh, see if we can hear a difference. So right now, just as far as the way this amp is set, I've got the bass on five, I've got the treble on five, I have the bright switch engaged. Uh, those of you who have uh, played these types of amps know that uh, Fender uh, has a little bright switch that's going to give it a particular type of tone. Um, and I'm going to have the volume to start out with uh, up to five. Um, you know, it, it may be difficult to kind of, uh, through the uh, digital medium here, uh, to see really how loud this amp is going to be, uh, about turned about halfway up. But uh, let's have a listen to it, see if we can't uh, hear a difference. Uh, I've got a, just a stock uh, 60s uh, reissue Strat here. power amp distortion that's what's coming through there uh, problem with that is I'm probably knocking Wade back about three feet with this it's it's pretty loud um, and right now we're like I said we're about halfway up uh, oh, yeah we're about halfway up 60 cycle hum gotta love it um, so you know if I turn it up any louder we're gonna get more and more breakup but we're also gonna get a, a little bit more volume out of it and it's uh, it's gonna be pretty earth-shatteringly loud let's do that just for two seconds Wade doesn't mind Right now I got it just about all the way pumped up. So we're getting some real nice power amp break up there, but we're also uh, waking the neighbors up. Uh, so I think that can kind of give you an idea of what this amp sounds like. Uh, it's, it's pretty darn loud. Even if we bring the volume down to say about, let's say, three, uh, that's a manageable volume, that's a manageable volume, but uh, the amp sounds a bit uh, weak, a little bit uh, choked. You really need to turn an amp like this up a little bit to get it, to get that nice full, get that nice full power amp uh, sound that we were getting when we were just up here a little bit. You gotta open her up a little, she sounds real good when you get right around there. So now let's uh, let's try these. Uh, let's try converting this amp to a Class A 10 or 15 watt EL84 powered monster. Uh, we should be able to get that kind of juicy power amp break up at a much lower volume. We're also going to get a different characteristic in the in the tone, probably a little bit more mid range. I don't know. Let's have a listen. Okay, I got this uh, thing all loaded up and ready to go. Let's have a listen to it. I'm going to uh, start out with the, uh, the same setting. Bass on 5, treble on 5, volume on 5, and the bright switch on. different characteristic of tone. Uh, let's turn it up a little like we did. This will be uh, almost cranked. up in a real juicy tone. Let's try running it uh, a little more starved like we did with, uh, with the other amp there. This is uh, on about three. It's a, it's a little more manageable at a lower volume. Um, you get, it's a little more manageable at a lower volume. You get a, a little fuller um, tone than you did with the 6L6s at a lower volume. So again, this will make this amp a much more viable recording uh, solution and uh, it'll also give you just a very different tone. It feels different when I'm playing it. Uh, the response characteristics of the amp are very different. Uh, it's a little more responsive with, uh, with the um, EL84s in there.
you know, when I play softer, it cleans up a little bit when I play low. So it's something cool to do, uh, and it's not too expensive. Give it a try. Okay. Uh, yellow Jackets. Um, very cool. Um, those, uh, those of you who are watching the podcast at home, probably a little hard to tell how the levels are, but uh, Alex, describe kind of what, what we got out of that. Yeah, I mean, you can get a, a, a... Well, what I noticed was you can get a much juicier, low-volume, clean sound. Once we rolled the, the 6L6 equipped uh, Pro Reverb down to about 3, the tone just went right out the window with the non-master volume. You really got to be three and a half to four for anything to happen. Right, right. When we put the 84s in there, I rolled it down to three or even below that, and we still got kind of a cool, small amp kind of tone, like taking a champ, turning it about halfway up. And about halfway up, um, I was kind of surprised. I mean, at least to my ears, the 84s broke up more than the 6L6s, but the Pro actually broke up pretty good, about five. Um, so it just, I thought it was cool. It gives you a, a different tone. Uh, and there are also, I guess I should mention that uh, the Yellow Jackets are a uh, product of, I think, THD. Uh, there's also Groove Tubes makes something like that, and I think there's a number of other companies that make mm -hmm. similar products. So, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Does the Yellow Jacket change the wattage of the amp overall? Or does it yeah, it, uh, I think it cuts it uh, down by about a third third or something so if you have a 40 watt amp you're you're down to about a 10 12 watt amp or something oh, like cool. that i think i'm not exactly sure how much but it it really cuts your power down pretty dramatically um it's a pretty smooth alternative to doing the the power break or the the power soak mm -hmm. kind of thing it's a little cheaper and it gives you a little different tone too we'll yeah. describe the power break and the power soak yeah the a power soak basically what it does is it tricks your amp into thinking that your uh, there's there's not a lot of power going to the speakers, so you can you can it, it's like turning down your speakers, you know, in a very weird way. It, it's it's connected unlike a pedal. It's in a pedal you're plugged from your guitar to the floor somewhere, and then into your amplifier into the front end of the amplifier. With a power soak, what's going on is you're you're plugging the head, um, and you're putting something like a almost like a pedal in between the head and the speakers. So you're, you're turning down the level at the speakers, but you can crank the head, which is really cool. So you can get that power amp breakup. Right. And what yeah. I noticed about the, the, uh, the Yellow Jackets were on that Pro, you were, you know, somewhere between... I mean, you, you had it cranked at one point. Mm -hmm. It was pretty, and pretty freaking loud, yeah. It was pretty loud, but, but yet it wasn't as loud as that amp goes by any means, you know. And it was breaking up in a really cool and tight way. Oh, you mean when I had the 84s in? When you had the 84s in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. When you had the yellow jackets in. So yeah. I think it's a, it's, a, um, it's a cool alternative to that because you can change the character of the amp, plus you can get it to break up at, at lower volumes, you know, which, yeah, is, when which I, is very Yeah, when I cranked it, it got, like Class A amps tend to, when you really push them, it yeah, got Yeah, it was, it was a tighter swirl. distortion. Well, it got yeah. swirly and weird. You know, yeah. it got, it, it, which is kind of characteristics of like a lot of the higher gain class A amps. There's a lot of new companies that make small, very uh, expensive, hand wired class A amps, and uh, you know I've heard people talk about the characteristics of them. And and when you really pummel those 84s, like this kind of, it creates this sort of chaos that kind of occurs. They get kind of erratic, almost like a, a fuzz face. Well, I'm not a, a yeah, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the the Vox. I mean, I'm I'm such a Fender geek. You know, but but there are attributes of the of the Vox that are cool. It's that that sort of mid rangey and tight, just mm. tight tight overdrive. But it, but what I don't like is that there's it's void of all sort of bottom end or, or fullness. And that lose seems a little like low end, you gain a lot of gain. Uh, seems mid -range like what the the, yeah. the pro really you know and Fender amps in, in general really helped to maintain all that. Plus get that boxy feel. So it was like it was yeah. perfect. It was yeah, like it was kind of cool. Control. Right, yeah. exactly. It kind of it 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 still kept a lot of the fender bottom end but still had a little bit right, more right. mid-range so what was that was that good. thd product that, that you cool. were using for a while oh it's a hot plate okay so what is what it's called so you know what your amp sounds like without the hot plate and with the hot plate is the hot plate giving you the same kind of thing that changing the tubes would be or it's, is it giving you the exact same sound but at lower volume it's not a 6l6 breakup in a, in a fender is is very it's muddy and it's it's um, yogurty. Well, it's, it, yeah. I basically, I equate it to it. It sounds like yogurt. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's 
<laughs> it's clumpy in a weird way. But it, well, I mean, yogurt's, I, a, yogurt's a perfect description. Because yeah, ever yeah. since you threw that term out there, yeah. when I hear a Pro Reaver cranked up a little bit and you get that, that weird sort of Fender low-powered breakup, I can't separate myself from thinking yogurt now because that's that's yeah it's, it's not perfect. crunchy it's not crunchy yeah. it's a, it's well we know. took your we took your ple we took a 50 watt plexi i think or a 100 watt plexi a marshall head yeah. and used your power soak and turned it like way down to where you you know i'm talking louder than we had it yeah and it really it was 80 percent of what a cranked plexi kind of sounds like sure. the only thing that didn't really happen is you're not resonating the speakers at 100 full watts, Which so that's not a little different. That's interesting, but it still that. it still gave you that sort of like holy cats. The well, the THD yeah. actually sort of compensates for that, and you know you can't get you know you know you can't get the real thing. Yeah, you know I mean there's nothing like the real thing as they as they it's always just crank say. in a plexi. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. But but they sort of they they, they do uh, sort of compensate for that. There's the Marshall makes a power break, which I've heard and it actually sounds pretty muddy. It sounds a little different, and and I, I actually prefer the THD. So, but but the, and the the Yellow Jacket is a THD product as well. So I mean, they're, yeah, they're and, really doing a great and also job. there. I guess we should say there's also a number of different power attenuators. I think Bad Cat makes one, Doctor Z, a number mm -hmm. of, number of companies make these types of devices. Yeah. So those are. I, we should probably do a, a podcast on that. Um, that's another cool way to actually. Uh, I guarantee the next podcast <laughs> we will do one. Yeah. is going to be of the THD. The, yeah, the power. The but but, power but doing board. both of those things, the THD or the yellow the jackets, light, is a good way to just take one generally good amp and really expand on on its versatility. Yeah. Well, well, do you think that it uh, it's kind of overlooked for a player to not consider? you know, modifying their amp for different sounds. I mean, we get customers coming in all the time who are changing pickups on their guitars. They're changing the bridges. They're going to different materials, different strings. I mean, guitars are modded, you know, 20 ways from Tuesday mm -hmm. before anybody says, hey, what can I do to my amp? I mean, obviously you can change speakers and that's gonna change the, the color of an amp. But, you know, these yellow jackets, I'm sorry, they're how much, roughly? They're, I, I'm guessing that they're about 30 bucks a piece. I think uh, most most companies charge somewhere in that neighborhood between, let's say, 25 and 50. And, and a good, per, pa and a good you know, pair of L84s? You know, 84 is probably, yeah, each. 15, 20 bucks a pop, maybe Okay, less. so I mean, you're well under 100 bucks for this kind of mod. And, and you get a new amp and with different characteristics, both EQ-wise, response-wise, and, and overall output-wise. Right. I guess I, another good point about scaling down to Class A is that uh, you're not necessarily, even though you're, the power is being diminished by a factor of three or whatever, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily reducing the overall volume by that amount. You know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, you're, yeah. it's still, that's what I think is the Achilles heels. You still kind of got to turn them up a little, you know. But, uh, and Class A is know. different than Class AB, and that's a whole other discussion. You know, but it's, it's, it's pretty relative. Well, yeah, it, fe it feels different. You know, that's why I think it, when you play it, you know, you're sort of interacting with right. with the amp a little differently. So, Well, I think the reality for a lot of people these days, particularly in an urban environment, is you're in apartments or you have neighbors who don't want to hear you cranked up to those, you know, really ear-piercing volumes. I mean, so for, for home practicing, for recording and stuff like that, yeah, the reality is you have to find a way to make your amp sound rich or what you want at lower volumes, you know, for when you're recording or when you just need to, to practice more quietly and not, you know, drive mm -hmm. yourself and out of the neighborhood. For that. It's yeah. perfect for that. And yeah, uh, like you said, that we should do a, a thing on uh, those power attenuators. Same deal. That's you know? it's an amazing yeah. idea. And I, I think, yes, the, the next podcast, I will <clears throat> definitely, definitely tackle that because it's, it, it, it's something that a lot of people don't know, you know, and it makes your life so much easier. You know, when obviously, like you said, in an apartment, in a house with, you know, other people who don't want to hear your guitar playing, or even in a in a, you know, when you play the smaller club where you got your amp. I remember sure. having my twin or my dual showman or whatever at three and three quarters. You know, right. and the guys would say, "Can you turn your amp down?" And I'd down. be at three oh. and three quarters. I'd be like, "But it sounds so juicy." No, this that's way. it. Yeah, yeah, if I turn it down any farther, the whole thing goes to hell. Right. right. I mean, when we were using, we uh, on a demo, we used the Pro the other day, and we had it uh, like two, two and a half, and I was going, "Ah, eh, it won't do its thing." You know, right. and I noticed on that Pro, you like when we when we were doing the the eighty four versus six L six thing, the Pro fell apart at three. I mean, it mm -hmm. really did. You know, the the eighty fours kind of were still kind of a cool little. Had a man too bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So anyway, well there's, a, well, there's a real weird taper to uh, new Fender 
tube amps, uh, you know, not the not the high-end custom shop stuff, but you know the the twin reissue, you know, when it first came out, the Vibra Verb and the Vibra Lux, uh, you know, there's a taper to the volume pot now that they're using on those amps. That there's nothing that from different. zero to two, yeah, and then it jumps yeah. up. I mean, wow. and, that, and that's another thing. I the think reverb that, does the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's so they funny definitely is are different. They respond differently. They sound pretty similar. I think ultimately they sound pretty damn close. Right. But, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, but, what's, uh, what's crazy yeah, definitely too? I noticed that's the one thing I noticed the taper on the pots on, right. on the new. Reviews yeah, you'll notice are you'll notice yeah. when I'm using my THD head or a THD the the hot plate when I get to three, it's about as distorted as I want it to be, which yeah. in actuality on three, without this hot plate, it's crazy. On your reissue <laughs> twin or so, on your pro? On the reissue twin. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. There's I mean, just but if you go below yeah. that, forget it's it. It's like almost no threshold. It's over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and it's all that's on, the way they are. You know, but that's that's the cool thing about that is, is that you got your twin, and on the nights when the twin rocks, it rocks. But on the nights when they, when I you always get it down there. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. need it rocking at yeah. from zero to point nine. So to for those of you who have been in that situation, either try a power attenuator or possibly. Something like uh, the yellow jacket. Yellow jacket. Yes. Might, uh, oh, might be a nice thing to God throw in the bag. God bless THD. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good story. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I wanted to uh, bring up tonight too. Uh, we have been recently around the shop. When it when it gets a little dead, we need to kind of just uh, throw a change of pace in. We've been checking out funky guitar related videos on YouTube. So this is this is going to be our first little YouTube spot here because there is an amazing amount of really cool stuff on totally. YouTube these days. And, and if, go ahead. I was going to say if you're watching this camera one or camera <laughs> two on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Because it's going to be broadcast on YouTube. And just just like, that nine seconds, it's going to be the <laughs> camera A, camera B guy. Uh, you, who, who was it who, who first discovered the, the shreds thing? Was that you who saw something? Eddie Van Halen shreds or something like that? I think that it was actually you? Vince. Oh. I think Vince came in. No, maybe I did actually just click on it you or did. something. You did. We were looking up. Wow. That was the first one we saw. Eddie Van Halen. Well, the, yeah, okay. <laughs> one of the many <laughs> ways we waste time at their shop <laughs> and while I, Wade is gone. I, I, <laughs> regardless of how we initially and it's found this, there's a, there's a couple of guys that do this, but I read in, I think it was Guitar Player, about a Danish guy. that he, he, The man's a genius, but basically what he does is he takes uh, an existing video of Ingve Malmsteen concert or footage. concert Anything footage, kind of basically. Hendrix at, Hendrix at, at yeah. Monterey, right. you know. And, uh, and then he plays, he takes the audio out and then he, he plays his own audio over it. And it's, he's the man's a genius. It's, it's just really funny. He, it, it's it's cute. poking fun at him and, and most people see it as just, you know, most of the artists seem to I mean, he's actually doing it with, awesome, but with, he's doing it with talent though. I mean, every time the, the player seems to accentuate some <clears> sort of crazy note, I mean, he will do it way over the top. You know, I mean, facial expressions, everything. I mean, he's studied these. I mean, I don't know who's who's more of a geek, the guy who goes on the site looking to see the real thing or the guy who's actually doing the uh, the YouTube thing because it, it it's is hilarious. So well, well, here, let's, right let's, let's, let's pause for 20 seconds and let's take a look at Judas Priest shreds. This is awesome. Cool. <laughs> The monster! <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do like the. Uh, ding, 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 ding. Yeah, it's. Yeah. And, the, and the beatbox? Mm. Oh, beatbox! Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh my god, I need to party with this guy. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. He's, he's obviously, you know, talented enough to be able to play exactly on the neck where these guys are playing. You know, you, you can tell that, you know, he's good enough. That when he's sounding bad, that he's not really that bad. Right, right. But he just it's, bad but enough to make him. But the yeah. fact that there's just a little murmur of the audience in the background, it you know, the drums. You, you, it, <laughs> yeah. And and only when you cut to the bass player does the bass player actually get. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and then like, where did the bass player go? Yes. Oh, yes. it's absolutely amazing. 
Uh, I also wanted to, to just bring up uh, something that, I mean, I didn't discover, but for myself I discovered on YouTube, uh, this ukulele guy, this uh, Jake uh. Shimabakuru, Bakuro, uh, I want to spell that. Shimabukuro, and he's from Hawaii, and uh, he is just an amazing ukulele player, and we've been, we've been selling ukes pretty well here at the shop, I mean, we're just obviously a guitar shop, but we throw a few ukuleles up, because... This guy's the Hendrix of ukes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just absolutely Ukulelers. amazing stuff, you know, and he's, you know, a young, really kind of personable guy, so I mean, he's got, you know, the charm to go with it, but he's totally got the chops, and he's just, yeah. you know, he's just ripping up a tenor uke. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tenor, you I swear it's though, watching great. him, it's it's pretty great. It's like uh, you, you kind of get the sense of uh, almost like yeah, seeing like an early guitar god. Only he's a tenor you've got. Yeah. Well, it, well, <laughs> it just it just dawned on me actually where where I first heard about it. It was actually a customer who came in and said, "I want to buy a ukulele because I saw this guy on YouTube, this Jake, and he couldn't even pronounce the name. It was Jake wow. Shimakuku Baru or whatever. <laughs> and he said, I, I want to know what kind of ukulele he plays and I want to buy a uke. So, uh, you know, I, I quick Googled it and found uh, the YouTube videos and uh, went to his website and it told what kind of uke he played. And even though we don't have that brand of, you know, three, four thousand dollar handmade, you know, Hawaiian koa uke, you know. Well, that's we, the secret behind <laughs> 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 The uke that plays itself. Is, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, no, it's, he's, it's pretty, pretty cool. It though. tunes itself too. Well, we'll get to that. All right, that's the YouTube. Uh, check <laughs> check out, uh, about you? anything yeah. shreds. Actually, just just go to YouTube and type in shreds, and you'll, you'll probably get a list of type in a whole bunch of them. Your least All favorite guitar them. god. Yes. And shreds. I I, uh, I personally recommend Ozzy Jakey Lee shreds. Yeah, Jakey <laughs> that's a good Lee one. Shreds. As well as Iron Maiden shreds. Oh, what a nice one. With a star. Yeah, with a very nice <laughs> Ozzy. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh hey! Yeah. Can't wait to hear this. the guitar he does. The ruffling paper. Oh, yeah. awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, my story this week, uh, I decided to do, uh, put together a little information about uh, collectible guitars, investment guitars. I mean, we've been open for 19 years. I've had customers asking me for all 19 years advice on uh, buying collectible guitars. Uh, you know, there's still some good stuff out there. So uh, Definitely. Let's see what I've got to say. For 19 years, I've had my shop here in Milwaukee, and I have had people buying guitars from me for that 19 years that they want to collect, that they want to invest in. And for the full 19 years, people have been asking me, you know, what are good guitars to invest in? What are good guitars to collect? Back in the day, uh, late 80s, early 90s, frequently I would hear from, uh, from some of my middle-aged customers, boy, I used to be able to buy 60s strats in the pawn shop for 300 bucks. I wish I could go back in time and buy those guitars up so I could have them now and, and have all of that money that they're worth. And I used to tell everybody, all of the guitars that you're talking about are here now. They're just not 60s strats and 50s Les Pauls. They're all the guitars that I have hanging on the walls now. And I actually went and dug out some invoices from 1989 of guitars that I sold here in the shop and it's kind of funny, you know, here's a, a 1970 Les Paul uh, from 89, we sold for 449 bucks. Uh, a Fender Coronado hollow body, 275 bucks, 1966. Uh, 79 Gibson SG Standard, 269 bucks. Fender Tele Deluxe, 1974, 450. I mean, and it goes on and on. Most of these guitars have appreciated somewhere between 500 and over 1,000% uh, in, in that amount of time. So looking at what guitars are available now, well, you know, the great days of Fender and Gibson are kind of over. You know, Fender and Gibson have grown exponentially. They're producing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of guitars every year. And the guitars that you get off of the rack from Fender, Gibson, Gretsch, Guild, and so on, are not what they were when these were the great small American handmade companies. But there's still a lot of good bargains out there right now for, for the collectors, for the guys who want something that's not super expensive. Obviously, 50s and 60s Strats, Telecasters, uh, 50s Les Pauls, and so on. Those guitars are tens of thousands of dollars, and a few of them are hundreds of thousands of dollars. What we have these days that are really great values are things like uh, I picked out a handful of things that I think would be, you know, within a lot of customers' reach in terms of a really great collectible instrument. And 
I'll even preface this by saying, you know, if you go into guitars, uh, guitar shops that sell vintage guitars, if you're paying the retail price that they're asking for a guitar and you even think, well, you know, that's top buck on it today, guaranteed those guitars, those old Fenders and Gibsons, even the ones that are, you know, from the 70s and early 80s, they're going nowhere but up in value. So, I mean, here's a handful of things I picked out just as an ex example of guitars that are pretty affordable and I think would be very cool and collectible. Late 70s Fender Telecaster Deluxe. I mean, you can pick those up for between 1500 and two grand, maybe a little over two grand for a really clean one. I guarantee, you know, late 70s Fender Tele Deluxe, it's a super cool guitar. They're going nowhere but up in the future. Awesome investment. Uh, 1990 Japanese made Fender Blue Flower Stratocaster. These are the ones that have the sparkly blue flowers on them. They also come in the pink paisley variety. Very, very cool. And even though they're Japanese made, I mean, these guitars are rare today now for those original ones. And if you get a clean one, all original, fantastic investment. Uh, late 60s Gibson SG Melody Makers. These were kind of low end for Gibson, but I mean it's that 60s Gibson quality made in Kalamazoo. You can pick those up in custom colors, Pelham Blue or the Red for around 1500 bucks. Guaranteed nowhere but up on something like that. Something really cool, uh, if you're looking for a little more unique, uh, a mid-60s Vox Phantom 12 string. These are the ones that are kind of shaped like a coffin. They play great, they sound amazing. I mean, there's there's nothing cooler than playing a Vox Phantom just in terms of having a very cool guitar. Uh, and something even recent that I, that I am sure is going to be a very collectible guitar. Uh, Rickenbacker made a model called the 650 Dakota. It's this walnut tongue oil finished solid body. They're handmade in California. Uh, they sold new for about 750, 800 bucks. They recently discontinued them. Great investment. That guitar is certainly going nowhere but up in value because they only made, you know, maybe a couple thousand of those in in the five or ten years that they made them. Very cool guitar. Another thing about these guitars that you know are within reach of collectability is they're an investment that you can take out of the case and play. I mean, they're they're beautiful guitars. They look cool. I mean, I don't think there's many of you that are pulling stocks out of your portfolio and going, "Oh my God, this is gorgeous." But if you pull a late '70s, you know, black Telecaster Deluxe out of the case and strum it, you know, it's going to make your heart go pitter patter. They're great investments. They're still out there. They're in little guitar shops. They're on eBay. Uh, they're in magazines like Vintage Guitar Magazine where a lot of the big dealers are advertising their cool vintage stuff. Check them out, pick one up. They're still out there. A spot like that. <laughs> Questions for you, Wade. What year was that rocket? The rocket? Oh, I was, uh, I was playing the Harmony Rebel. Oh, the Rebel. And the Rebel was a 72, that, that lovely olive green. I mean, I know all like that. Like new 72. I was just checking to see if you <laughs> <laughs> We do have a very, very cool uh, three pickup. Why don't you grab the three pickup from any rock? I've already right? collected four of those. Yes. This, this was. This, you don't see these every day. This was the one that didn't make the cut for the uh, for the info about. Oh, she's clean. Yeah, I mean, this is one of, one of the other cool guitars. You know, in in that great Chicago harmony tradition, which still very affordable uh, and a great investment piece, because you know even this kind of cheap catalog Chicago stuff made in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s is it's great investment. That was one of my questions. Uh, you know, during your thing, I was I was wondering about just like as far as collectability, silver tones, K's, harmonies, nationals, those types of things. What do you what do you think the long term? Um, well, well, generally speaking, you know, it's always been, you know, my experience that the weirder it is, you know, the more it is collectible or the quality. You yeah. know, so, so really cheap, bad catalog guitars from the 40s, Super 50s, unique. 60s, 70s. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like bad ones, the low end stuff or the stuff that was just terribly made, nothing unique about it. I mean, oh, there's, there's okay. very, very little collectible about right. the stuff that, that is just poorly made or, you know, is somehow a very, very bad, cheap Gibson or Fender knockoff that has, you know, no real intrinsic value. Right. It, it therefore has no collector's value either. Right. But you put three pickups on it and sparkly pick guards and 20 switches. It could, <laughs> it, right. it, could, it could have, you know, a roller coaster neck, but if it is unique enough that, that they just packed all this stuff right. on to make it almost like a piece of art, right, right. It's, it's going to be very collectible. There's a guitar we have uh, in completely unplayable shape in the basement that I occasionally uh, see down there and the, I just... It, the Crucianelli Tone Master. That's the one. Yeah. It just looks so freaking cool. It's like you just want to 
play it, you know. And I mean, every once in a while, I'm like, well, maybe I should take a look at this oh, neck yeah, and see if we can't uh, fix this thing. And it's like, no, 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 back to the dust bin, you know. But it's just so cool looking. You just, you know. Yeah, it's. it's I think long term, something like that is gonna. I mean, they probably already have gone up. But, the one he's talking about is it's called a Cruciinelli Tone Master. It's one of these just really funky uh, '60s Italian guitars that's covered in the same material that you know the Italian companies were covering covering all of their accordions in. So I mean, it looks like. If, if an accordion designer designs kind of a guitar, it looks kind of like a jazz master ish shape. These really funky little rocker switches, and yep. you know, the, the pickups look like they're right out of a 60s science fiction movie. Yep. You know. Yep, way cool. Very yeah. weird, very cool. Yeah. Throw yep. back up there for me. Thank you, sir. Interesting. <clears throat> Wait on that on that same subject. I was going to ask you what you what you thought about uh, like PRS's, Heritage's, GNL's, Hamer's, things like that. Wow, that's really Long funny. Term. Because yeah. because I had thought about kind of throwing into the mix, you know, something in those categories as a potential collectible. They're all, you know, a, they're all a little bit new right now to really kind of put your thumb on which ones are the hot ones. You know, PRS, you know, really kind of started, you know, hitting the ground running, you know, mid to late 80s is when people started catching on. Uh, you know, an, an early PRS is probably, you know, a surefire collectible thing just because, he, you know, they weren't making that many of them at the right. time. You know, limited quantities are always going to help. Uh, G&L, you know, guitars that were made while Leo was still alive, Leo Fender was alive and running the company, he signed inside the neck pocket on a lot of the guitars of G&Ls. So, I mean, you get one with a Leo signature, uh, very good. Okay. Uh, Heritage. You know, Heritage is the company that was founded by <clears throat> the Gibson Craftsman in Kalamazoo. When Gibson moved from Kalamazoo to Nashville, some of the old guys really didn't want to move and have to learn, you know, basically a whole new, more corporate assembly line way of making guitars. They stayed and, and sort of took over the old Gibson factory and started making their own guitars that they called Heritage, you know, and the name meaning, you know, the, Her the Gibson Heritage mm -hmm. of, of handcrafting these guitars, you know, so yeah, a lot of that heritage stuff, I would say particularly, you know, some of their hand carved jazz guitars, mm -hmm. you know, are going to be, uh, you know, very, very collectible. Uh, what's their, their big jazz guitar, the Golden Eagle or the mm -hmm. Eagle or something like that, you know, hand carved jazz guitars from heritage, I think, are going to be a surefire thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, the other uh, note I had was uh, a little more controversial, but uh, uh -oh. what about some of the, the really nice... Uh, you know, handmade U.S. Uh, kind of heavy metal guitars like Jackson, Charvel, Kramer, B.C. Rich, those types of companies. Like, it, it seems like people will walk in the shop with those, you know, their $2,800 list, and I'm like, yeah. would you take 40 bucks? You know, I mean, <laughs> you, there's just not, it doesn't seem like, at least for us, we have much of a market for that. I can look at the guitar and say, yeah, you know, it's very well made, obviously, good components and so on, but, I mean, is is there a point in which those are going to, I'm sure people, you know, have a market for those, but is, is, you know, 10 or 20 years down the line, are those guitars going to shoot through the roof, or is that just one of those things where you... That might be the parlor you know, guitar of, of the guitar. <laughs> yeah. In know. 2040, you right, know, yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you what do you think about I that? Mean, well, I, I'm I, real well, curious. Well, the, the yeah. heyday of the metal guitar was the 70s. I mean, that's when the great American heavy metal guitar makers, you know, hit the market. So the early Kramers, I mean, so this is all going to be mid late to late 70s. 70s. Yeah. Uh, so Kramer... Dean, BC Rich, you know, those 70s ones that are handmade, you know, particularly uh, the, the higher end BC Riches and uh, Dean guitars that are, you know, like set Cadillacs neck or neck and, through body, yeah. lots of nice inlays. Uh, you know, Dean allowed you to order everything custom shop. I remember back in the early 1980s, my brother and I went down to Biasco Music in Chicago and ordered him a, a Dean Baby ML. And he basically sat down and said, I want ebony fingerboard, I want mother of pearl blocks, I want five ply binding, I want this finish, I want this bridge. And it was it was custom shop from the ground up. He got to select oh, wow. everything he wanted. Cool. And I remember his guitar was eight hundred bucks. Oh, ah! cheap. <laughs> and it was and it was made, you know, handmade in Chicago to all of his specs. Wow. You yeah. know, the, and when he got the guitar, beautifully crafted, played like a dream, and it was about four and a half pounds. Oh, wow. I mean, just super light, resonant, you know, I mean, those Everything guys... totally handpicked. Those guys knew what they were doing. Hang tag on that in our store today. 
Uh, well, well, it's really funny because <laughs> you know when when in the in the first couple of years that I was open, he sold me a couple of hundred dollars a pound. <laughs> well, he sold me a couple of his guitars because you know he was uh, in need of a little bit of money, and I think that the Baby ML came through my shop, and you know in 1990, 91, you know we probably sold it at that time for a grand. I wow. think I think a Baby ML now, like the one that he had, would would easily be a couple grand. Hmm. Just, okay. just because so you know he bad. he had appointed it very nice. It didn't have a Floyd Rose or a Kaler Lock. We don't see on many it. of those. No, people are hanging on to them, right. and then that's a good indicator. It must be, right. yeah, because I mean we see, you know, Kramer Strikers and things like that. But I mean nothing that that has you know amazing craftsmanship. I mean not that the Kramers are are bad, but they're just they're so simple. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean up to up to the Floyd Rose part, everything right. simple. Yeah, it gets you real know, complex you know, after that. Yeah. Put all the well, well, Dean complexities is up, into that. Dean Guitars is up and running again, you know, and most of their guitars are made overseas, but they are still doing a they handful have a, of guitars. They have a new custom shop I saw, or right. I don't know how new it is, but they yeah, have and, some sort of custom shop. Yeah. And it's, cool. it's, you know, I think starting at about 2800 bucks for a pretty, a pretty simple American guitar. And it's the price of anything new that drives up the price of the old stuff. You know, so if you take, for instance, uh, a Martin D28, well, 20 years ago, you know, a D28 in a guitar shop was probably about 700 bucks. You know, now it's about two grand, and that $700 guitar from 20 years ago is now going to sell for probably 1,400 bucks. 15, yeah. Right, because you know, every, everything is going up. You know, basically at the uh, cost of living increases other than the things that are driven up even faster. And of course, you know, a guitar like a Martin guitar is driven up because of craftsmanship and because of the scarcity of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the beautiful hardwoods that they use, you know, the yeah, and the, history and the rosewood of and stuff. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that was going to be my, I don't know if you probably have some questions too, but that was kind of my last question I was going to ask you, Wade, was what, what would be, uh, what would you, if you had to name a couple of, of good investments for a new guitar, what would you say? <clears throat> Brand new? Uh, I would probably be inclined to say something like uh, Gibson Historic guitars. Uh, they're not that much more than the regular guitars. So if you if you take uh, a historic Les Paul Gold Top, you know, and you know we're not a Gibson dealer, so I don't off the top of my head know what the prices are, but I think they they probably discount into the mid to high twos. Yeah. So you know maybe you know. Eight hundred to a thousand dollars more than an, an off-the-shelf the Les Paul cool standard. Top. Yeah, right. but the, the historic is a is it like a throwback sort of thing? It's a custom yeah, shop it's, recreation type of deal. Yes, yeah. yeah, the yeah the historic is like their their custom shop reissues of specific years. So rather than you know like the, the regular Gibsons, they do the, the Les Paul like classic, the which classic is like roughly 60s. a sixty. Yeah, right. but okay. The, I got but you. the historic you know does perfectly a, a fifty-seven yeah. gold top. Or a '59 flame top cherry burst, or, okay. you know, and they're better quality woods. They're lighter weight. I think hmm. they're they may be handmade by one guy or less guys or something. Right. They're not assembly line made. Okay. You know. Remember that guy brought in the Jeff Beck? They made a, a he got a custom shop a reproduction of a Jeff Beck Strat, a '60, the like '1960. Was that the, the black one? Yeah, it was the black that one. Was, super that was light, actually really, amazing, crazy, really, really huge nice neck. Guitar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, I think it was a custom shop historic recreation of some sort. Right. You know, oh, so. very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize. That's that's very neat. Limited editions, I think, are a, a pretty safe way to go as long as they're not somehow inflated because they're limited edition. I mean, a lot of companies do uh, limited edition guitars where, or, yeah, or, well it could either be a signature or an anniversary of something where they're like, you know, we are going to make this incredibly expensive like and throw in a little bit of swag, a special, a special right, strap right. or something. But Seems I mean, like it's hard to predict whether those are going to be, like with Martin, sometimes people ask me, well, you know, what would you, you know, from an investment standpoint, do you buy a D28 or do you buy, you know, a Lawrence Juber or who's that guy, John Mayer signature model or something. Right. You know, to me, and it, you know, it's like you could pretty much set your watch by a D28, what a 28 was worth 20 years ago, right. 40 years ago, 60 years ago. You know, whereas, you know, John Mayer's Way Cool Today or whatever, I mean, you know, to those who were right. into it, or whoever Jacques Stotsam is or whatever, you know, because you you wonder, like, the, like we just sold a guitar called the Jacques Stotsam, and it's it's a really cool guitar, but I don't know who that guy is, really. I mean, he's a Danish fingerstyle player, but right. that's about all I know, you know. I mean, is that a safer bet than getting a D35 or D42 or, a, you know? Well, when I'm talking, you know, the limited editions that I'm more speculating on are the, the kind of thing where they're just saying, um, 
Well, like Fender, they do, uh, every five years, they do a special limited edition anniversary of the Stratocaster. You know, so there was a 20th anniversary and a 25th. Well, actually, it started with the 25th, that, that funky silver one from the late 70s. Okay, yeah. Uh, so 79, that would have been the 25th right, anniversary right, right. of the and Strat. Right, anniversary on it, yeah. Right, yeah. and, you know, it, it weighed a ton, you know. Oh, yeah, it it had this, this weird heavy mahogany body, a finish that yellowed and weather-checked. You know, not a really great guitar, but there's not that many of them out there. Ultimately, and you know, people are are grabbing them up now. Right, right. Yeah. So you know, along the line, Fender has done other anniversaries that were limited uh, in their quantities. I know they did a pretty limited number of like the 40th anniversary, and now we're already okay. So 54. So we've already had the 50th anniversary, and we're headed towards the 55th. But things like that, where they're just a, a more limited quantity of quantity of something really special about a particular guitar, not you know the signature necessarily kind of thing or uh, you know I, I think I just recently saw some limited edition uh, Clapton Blackie Strat that's like 22 grand brand new or something like yeah, that I yeah know. so I mean you know there right. there are things like that that are a, a pretty a pretty you're dangerous really, speculation yeah you're gonna have investment. to recoup your money in the next right. 150 years yeah, yeah if they start right. out that expensive yeah. how do you <laughs> yeah exactly right. exactly well I was I was thinking just in terms of uh, the other day a customer came in and uh, he had bought a Rick 360 from us, a beautiful finish on it, you know, and we had got it and used. I think it was an early 90s one or something like that. Right. And this was only, I don't know, three, four years ago or something like that, and I think we sold it for eight, nine hundred dollars right. Now, the last couple of years, Rick has had, and I should, guess I should mention we're a Rick dealer, but nonetheless, um, Rick and Bockers uh, are taking about two years uh, in production now. So we order one today, we don't see it for two years. Sort of as a result of that, you've seen the sort of the, the value of, of 360s kind of go up and up and up and up, and we're selling them for more because, you know. Right. So this guy was just going, oh, man, I can't believe I bought this beautiful Rick off you for 900 bucks. I mean, I could say, you know, I'm going to hang on to this thing. I can sell it tomorrow for right. 1700 I mean, it's kind of an example of, of something where this guy buys this guitar just because it's a cool guitar, but in the end, I mean, in less than three or four years, he's almost doubled his money in terms right. of the inherent value of it. So... You know that's kind of interesting. I think you know in terms that's, of something. That's the word gamble, though. You, yeah. I mean, you don't know what's what's going to do that. I mean, yeah, like Wade's saying, there, there are some sure bets, like the Rickenbackers for sure. But I mean, <laughs> it seems like every year Rickenbacker adds another year to how long it takes to actually get one. You know, and I mean that's Rickenbackers are for sure a sure bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that is weird because there are a number of things that affect it. Really, you know, you can't just say. You know, there's a there's there's a lot of different variables, so it's probably well, that's very the no, difficult. That's the no-brainer right, right now. I mean, that's that's for yeah. sure. If, yeah. As far as a new one, I would say, yeah, a Rick would be good. absolutely. Well, as a last note, yeah. the weird thing with Rickenbacker, though, is if you look back at the history of Rickenbacker, the, the weird thing with investing in Rickenbackers is there's very few Rickenbacker models that have done what the old Fenders, Gibsons, or Gretches have done. So right. there's very very few Rickenbacker models that are in that twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar area. Right. You can get a really really clean. 60s 360 12 string right from the period of Roger McGuinn, you know, for you know, three four grand. You know, whereas right. if you take a strap that cost about the same price in, in the mid 60s, that strap's worth 20 25 grand right now. Yeah, yeah. The thing uh, about those old strats is, though is they're because of that and because of there's such demand, is they're getting snapped up really quick, though. Yeah. And I mean, I think to some extent the fact that maybe there are more of those old Rickenbackers around because everybody's focusing so much on Gibson and Fender that there will be a day when there's going to be a $400,000, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah maybe. I think long term. Yeah. I mean, that's why I ask you about, uh, you know, somebody like Paul Reed Smith or something like that because, you know, it's it's like, you know, they're pretty well, I mean, they're very well made guitars, you know, yeah, so yeah. I mean, just in terms of the, the way they're made and the, the quality probably. of the woods and finish and so on. But you wonder, you know, is that is that something... Is that an investment grade guitar? I mean, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, are or those going to go the, through the roof? Or, you, know, you know, the the custom shop BC Rich of today. You know, I mean, who knows? Well, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, you can't. Know. You can never. Know. <laughs> yeah, right. All yeah. you can do is. But I mean, the important thing is to buy. I mean, there is also a level of buy a guitar you enjoy. You know, buy a guitar you like to play. If it for some reason happens to be worth a whole bucket load of money at some point you're lucky but I mean you should to some extent buy something that you're gonna play and enjoy 
You know what I mean? I think there's yeah, you got to find a balance. Even, yeah, yeah, even if you just play it once in a while, don't. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. something that you're going to definitely <laughs> take care of. But my other advice would be don't paint your '56 Strat pink <laughs> don't with house paint. Don't yeah. paint anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, All right, we're, without paint, <coughs> leave it. We're going to move it along here. <laughs> uh, we're just going to do a real quick uh, little take uh, take a look at tools. We have a, a lot of people who've been talking to us about. Uh, what kind of tools they should keep in their case when they're on the road. Just, I mean, just basically the, the, the tools. The pine box. <laughs> yes. It's perfect for everything. Uh, we're, we're just going to show you some of our favorite tools around the shop. So if you were putting together your own little set of tools, this is, is a cheap little rig right here that you could fly with. And for those of you who are taking care of your guitars by yourself and uh, like to kind of do your own tweaking, even if eventually you've got to bail on it and bring it into us, this is what you need to start with right here. Okay. Dan, what have we got first? How many, uh, how many dark, dark clubs have you tried to restring your guitars in? <clears throat> Need a good flashlight. Yes. yes. Need a good flashlight. All That's right. a basic one. Also, actually, really, really good for setting up pedals and things like that. I, it, I can't tell you how many times I've been on stage where you're, you're the middle of three bands and they, have, they intentionally have the lights down on the stage and you're trying to trying figure to, out yep. oh, yeah. what goes into what. So, I mean, of course, of course. This should, be, this should be built into your guitar, though, too. You should be able to just hit a button on your guitar and, and point, point your guitar at, at your pedals. No, they hire a guy to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Phillips head screwdriver. Maybe at number least two. one. <laughs> at least one. At least yes. one. Multiple if size tips if, yeah. if you can. I mean, if actually, oh, yeah, and, and recently, you know, I've been kind of... Uh, at home, going away from you know for for the easy little things around the house, uh, you know the the single size Phillips screwdriver. Of course, you know one good screwdriver is better than ten crappy ones. But there's some pretty good multi-tip screwdrivers yep, these yep. days. Where mm -hmm. if you don't like keeping twenty screwdrivers around in your little kit, get one of those little ones whoop, <laughs> that has all that the, one has a spring on that it. All, has all the little bits because you want the right size bit for the right size head. Think exactly. about, yeah, that you cool. can keep all the the uh, the tips together because some have the. You can leave it in the hand, hand or, or yeah, and something like that's a good thing to have. Yeah. Um, not too much of a call for a flathead screwdriver, but I, I and like the, Well, I like the small flathead. Mm -hmm. Maybe a number one. What is this? A number? I'm not saying uh, a number eighth inch by four. I don't know what that. Four inches and an eighth inch. Anyway, some um, kind of flathead <laughs> or two. Yeah. Seymour Duncan pickup height screws. Um, yeah. Your, Gibson as well. Your set screw knobs for your Telecasters, things like that. Or a lot amp, of the, your amp knobs. Or your amp knobs, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, f regular flathead knobs screwdrivers, yeah. way too big. And try sticking a, a, a you know, a, a jackknife blade in it. Forget about yeah, it. No. Like, you need, not gonna you need a couple the of long, those. The long, too, so you long, can, you can get skinny. in from the yeah. side and nice leverage. Yeah, yep, that yep. is the diggity. How many times have you played uh, a show, you look down, and the end of your shaller strap lock, uh, the uh, the nut on the end of it is, is on the stage, and you're going, why is my guitar still connected to my body? <laughs> Got to tighten those suckers <laughs> yeah, up yeah. every night. Yeah. Needle nose pliers. Slivers. Needle nose pliers. Yep. Slivers, yes. Big slivers. Um, you got to cut your strings. Clipper. There's, there's no need to leave the end of the string coming out of the guitar that long. And don't take a quarter and go like this with the thing on the string, because I just hate it. You want to poke your eye out. Just stop. Please. These, these are yeah. cheap, please. Just, just <laughs> snip them off. And when you come in and get them, forget about it. Restrung, yeah. Anyway, uh, you've got to tune the the, uh, the instrument. Good chromatic oh. tuner and a nice little uh, short jack cable like yes. that is nice to keep. I'd say keep three or four of those just in case. Those tuners are awesome. Uh, another good reason to have the flashlight is those, I mean, so they, they're not the backlit, the but they are affordable because they're not backlit and they're really, really... Uh, Really Get a chromatic accurate. tuner too, not a not just a guitar and bass tuner. This is a very cool little thing. Neck support, portable too. Yeah. Lay it on the. Uh, Forms a little tripod. Well, if I had the the back end of the. You can put it right on the table. Yeah. Just stick it right there. Stick your Whee! guitar on there. You can restring it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That is great, isn't it? I'm taking this home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, super glue. Your nut falls off. You glue it back on. What can't you fix with super glue? Um, whatever you can't fix with duct tape, fix it with super glue. Oh, duct tape is what we don't have, and yes, gaff tape or duct tape is a very key thing. But we don't yeah. use that in the guitar shop because that's not kosher. No, but on the road you need it. Yeah. <laughs> on the super glue, please buy the thick stuff. 
you squirt out that thin stuff and it Rubs oozes everywhere. down all over your yeah. fingers and under your fingernails, you are not going to be happy. They, yeah. It comes yeah, in wanna... it comes in medium thickness and gel. Get the medium thickness or the gel. It will save you oodles of headaches. True. Hand that over to me. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you can take that home tonight. String, String winder. String winder. You need it. String winder also includes a little notch on the bottom for popping the bridge pins out of your acoustic guitar. Thing. Don't use the needle nose for That's that. Yes, Stewart do say. not ever use yeah. a pliers for pulling bridge pins out of your guitar. Uh, graph it all. Let's have you explain. Yeah, that. well, this, this is, is a graphite lubricant. Check out uh, episode. No check out episode one. I talked about graphite. Oh, great! It's a yeah. great, great, very good stuff. And then uh, what do you got there, Dan? Um, assorted Allen wrenches for particular guitars that you have. I mean, it, it figure out what Allen wrench screws you have in your guitars. Find the mm -hmm. Allen wrenches. Saddle take adjustments. Take them with you. These ones with with the little screwdriver type handle on them, awesome. They're a little bit more expensive, but I'm telling you, little Allen wrenches are so easy to lose without that little handle on it. This one has a yellow tip, easy to see, and it tells you what size it is by that yellow tip. That is priceless around here. Yep. And, and, for this the, is, and for the modern, <laughs> for the modern guitarist, we had one vote on this tool. All right, all right, all right. Hand, so it over, hand, hand it over. Let's hand it over. Let me over explain to, this. Uh, Let me explain this. This I is like, some I Planet like, of the Apes technology. I don't know. <laughs> I like taking this on the road with me, and here's why. Because um, it runs out of batteries the first you night. Can, Let's load this you can get right. these uh, loaded with screw uh, tips. So there's all your screw tips. This box is only about a, an eighth full, by the way. So stop me if I uh, stop me if I say stop something. Stop me if you've uh, heard this one. Yeah. Um, but this has a string winder attachment on the end, and uh, the way I look at it is, on the road you want to restring your guitars as frequently as possible, and if you, uh, I like using one of these because it goes quickly, and it, uh, the easier it is for me to restring my guitar, the more likely I am to do it, and I think the big thing you want to try to do uh, if you're trying to play seriously is restring your guitars every gig, every other gig, something like that. So this makes this gets me motivated to do it, and also like we were talking about with screw uh, tips, you can keep a bunch of screw tips. You keep this little guy as your string winder. You can also pull bridge pins with it, and you can drill holes in your guitar if you have to to let <laughs> demons out. So it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know what? It, and as it just dawned on me as you're as you're demoing this, that yeah, when pop your screwdriver tips back in there, pulling your pick guard off your strap, eight screws, yeah, it is pretty zing, nice. Zing, zing, zing. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so if that. you want to get crazy, you can go that route, or you can be a little more punk rock primitive. <laughs> yeah. Either way, that's the way I roll. Awesome. Well, tool, that, that box of tools, even with the uh, electric screwdriver, probably about 50 bucks, you know, and if your guitar is $800 and your amp is $700, and, and it might go up. What you're spending value. on gas That's and everything else. <laughs> Investment grade tools. Yes. All right, our last story tonight, we're going to take a look at uh, Dan's part two of his homemade pedal board. What do we got, Dan? Well, at this point, the pedal board is made. And uh, arranging the pedals and getting power to the pedals is kind of important. I mean, you can choose to go 9 volt the whole way, but you're... I think you're limited because you're you're velcroing these these pedals to the board, and every time you've got, I mean, it just becomes Bad, a hindrance. Batteries, install batteries. Well, yeah, yeah, installing batteries. Sometimes you have to take right. the pedal completely off, take the bottom. Off, forget about that. That's that's yep. ridiculous. And what I'm going to show is um, a little thing that that's kind of outdated, but uh, <coughs> it's it's kind of the the first one of the first. Are you okay? Yeah. <coughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Keep rolling. This is good. This, yeah. this, is, this is normal for us. Um, but <laughs> we'll take that out of post. <laughs> yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a it's a simple solution basically for eliminating nine volts out of your life and making your life so much easier. And ba these things can get up to you know one hundred and fifty dollars, which isn't a, a real expense. I'll go into that. I mean, it, like I said, it pays for itself as far as nine volts. What's that, what's one volt, nine volt these days? It's like well, ten to. 20, 30 bucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, if they were vintage ones, they've gone up. So, at any rate, yeah, check this like out. Like a 9-volt adapter a or a battery? Oh, okay. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> Whichever. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at it. So we're gonna, about to embark on part two of, uh, of homemade pedal board madness here uh, on the podcast. So uh, what I want to do first off is I, I kind of want to discuss... The uh, the arrangement of pedals, or you know how you start. You've you've got this board. If you want to know where this board came from, refer to uh, um, the podcast uh, two. Um, that that was where uh, we, we went through uh, materials and and kind of how to construct this this thing. Uh, at any rate, let's uh, let's bypass all that. Let's get straight to uh, arranging the pedals 
and um, getting them to where you want to be foot wise and in the, the correct order. Um, it's important, I think, I don't think there's a wrong way or, or a right, there's, there's sort of a, a conventional right way to, uh, or a, a standard way to setting up pedals, which I like to do it. There are people who set up pedals um, opposite the way they should be. This gets very, uh, this gets very intricate. And I suppose I could do a, a, the next podcast I do, um, we could talk about arrangement of pedals and, and what affects what in certain ways. But anyway, to get, to get into um, how we're going to do it today, um, let's, uh, let's go with arranging these pedals the way I guess I would or way that the way the standard way is to, to do these. Um, so I'm going to do this kind of backwards, so it's going to be sort of weird, but it's going to look right on your end. Um, I always do the, the tuner first because I want the cleanest signal um, of my guitar going into the tuner first because I don't want anything altering pitch or the, the actual sound of the guitar. I want it as unadulterated as possible going, going into that guy. So what I do next is also for that matter, I want the compressor next. Uh, compression is, is a very cool effect. We can get into what that does, but it, it basically it, it uh, can, can amplify noise. So what you want to have is it bef you want to have it before distortion pedals and things like that uh, because uh, as we all know, distortions and fuzzes, they're going to really, really accentuate noise and basically they create noise, um, which is what my parents always said. Um, everyone's supposed to laugh, but no one's laughing. Anyway, uh, so overdrives next after the compressor, and then modulating effects or uh, you know delay based or reverb type effects uh, come after overdrives because you you want to feed uh, this the solid uh, kind of noisy signal into something that that's very almost clean based. Um, if you put it before, you're going to be feeding it into it gets mushy and you can't really decipher anything. But this is something we can go over later, obviously. But at any rate, for the sake of this uh, this demo, I'm going to set these pedals up as shown. All right, now here we've got everything hooked up. Um, you've got your in. Um, I think it's important to mention that these aren't velcroed down, which obviously they, they should be. But for the sake of this uh, this little experiment here, we're gonna we're gonna leave them unvelcroed. Um, you got your in. Um, you know everything set up the way we laid it out. Uh, yellow cables obviously are your connector cables. These little guys, these connector cables, which are barrels on both end, um, are going to be your connectors coming out of the uh, the AC power here. Um, you know this signal flex thing. I don't think they make this anymore, but this is uh, this is actually very indicative of you know the uh, the Dunlop brick or the the Voodoo Labs pedal power thing. Um, so pretty cool. I mean, you, you you just turn it on, everything starts flashing, everything is is ready to go. Um, no nine volt batteries, no hum, no anything like that. Uh, I think surge protection in this thing, like a normal power strip would have. Uh, so very very cool. And uh, I mean, once you get this this hooked up, the very the great the great part about that, turn it off, unplug it. When you're at the gig, take it home. When you get to the gig, plug it in, turn that on. You see lights flashing again. Everything's ready to go. All you have to plug in is here and out here. You're done. So pretty amazing, pretty cool. And like I said, saves you a ton of money and a ton of hassle once you get to the gig. So pretty great. OK. Uh, what is, I mean, that's not your current pedal board, right? No, no, that, that's, a, that's a pedal board that I was using through. Um, the last two bands I was in, and, and maybe um, you want to plug those old bands just for historical purposes. Carolina, and uh, a uh, an infamous band called the Benjamins. The Benjamins. Right. Yes. So old you school. you did use that pedal board for quite a while then, though, right? I did, I did, um, and it, it was great, and it, and it lasted a super. I mean, obviously, it's it's still alive and kicking. It today. still looks like you just built it for the demo. I mean, it looks really clean. I was sick of killing SKB. Pedal boards. I mean, they're plastic, uh -huh. which they're awesome. But they, if you put too many pedals on them, they flex and they crack, and you know, and that's that's just a problem. And and finding my own source of power wasn't that big of a deal. I u I I use, still currently use the the uh, power that I was using for that one, which is the I think Dunlop makes. It, it's called the DC Brick. It's 18 volts, you know, but it, it's one 18 volt input. I think there's seven. Um, nine seven uh, seven nine volt outputs, and then there's there's actually two or three 18 volt outputs. So, I mean, your your Dunlop flangers or uh, what <coughs> else is 18 volts? Univi uh, Univibes, I think, are 18 volts. So, I mean, pretty Some great. Some of the old Ibanez stuff. And th there have been pl moments where I've accidentally 
um, on stage have accidentally turned off the power and quickly turned it back on, and I haven't lost any of the settings on the pedals at all. I mean, it, it retains um, power for two or three seconds. I mean, it's great. It's totally great. That's awesome. Yeah. Very awesome. Well, one of the things I noticed, uh, well, somebody the other day was like, uh, what's the, uh, how's the quality on these, these pedals, you know? And uh, I forget what particular brand we were looking at, you know? Okay. And I, I basically just flat out said to him, if you put it in a pedal board, It'll and you forever. pack it up at the end of the <laughs> night, you're not going to have a problem with it. If you yank it off the stage soaked in beer and throw it into a duffel bag like a boomerang, you're probably going to yeah, run into problems. break knobs off. Exactly, gonna, you know, yeah, in the I mean, jacks and whatever. You know, so just even in a basic sense, to me, it's like a pedal foam. board just will save the life of your fifty to hundred and fifty dollar pedals. Yeah, you're keeping it's everything worth it right there. You know? You're not pulling cables in and out of the pedals yeah. all the time. That's a really good different point. cables all the time. I mean, the, the pedals, the, the cables are stationary. The, the cables don't wear out. I mean, yeah, the, you're wearing the, pedals, the sheaths out when you're plugging them in and out. Even yeah. putting them on the floor and letting them move around, things get torqued and pushed out of place. Yeah. Forget it. I mean, it's it's not for you know. Well, in part one, we saw your your case too. So I mean, this this little tank of a board you're dropping into this tank of a case. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I would I would feel pretty good about unplugging my in and my out, locking the cables in, dropping into that box. I mean, that when is, you that open is it a, up the next clean... time, it's just exactly like it was when you left. You know. And if you're anything yeah. like me, I mean, I I actually <clears throat> honestly have nightmares that we're starting a gig. And all my pedals are unplugged, and I need to figure out how to do it. that. Is such a pain in the butt. That's a, that's a really good point too. You don't have to look for anything. You don't have to find any power supplies. You just flip the thing open. It's all set up. You, you know, you just plug. You got. It makes it easy to justify having a lot of pedals doing a lot of different sounds because they're just they're there. They're being yep. powered. You know, you're not constantly having to put, you know, add other things and look for places for them and and you know trying to find a nine volt battery to. You know, I mean, it's there. You can use it if you want. I mean, it's just awesome. I do you mean, bring like it makes a hand life so much easier? Do you bring like a handful of uh, like backup patch cables, uh, power connectors, or I mean, is your is your rig like so reliable? I bring that I bring one, one patch cable. Do you bring your own uh, extension cord too? Like do you I do. Yep, I do. It's it's do. it's really important to uh, bring an extension cord for something like that because. Some of the, we're we're just now getting in, into a point where you, when you're playing out live, a lot of guys are using effects pedals that need to be plugged in on the front of the stage. But a lot of these clubs don't have power. In Which the front of the stage. I don't understand. But go <laughs> well, yeah, I don't understand either. But I need something. power up here, and they look at you like, uh, you have well, that's not gonna happen. Got to be prepared yeah. for because yeah. it always yeah. it happens. always happens. Yeah. I have a ten foot orange. Yeah. You know, like an outdoor right. cable I that, yeah, I, that I run. Twenty-five footer, heavy duty. Throw it in the thing. Anything yeah. that'll that'll reach from you know wherever you're standing to where your amp is plugged in is the best thing. You can throw it in the back of your amp. You don't have to throw it in with the cables, but and you don't always use it. But I'll tell you, the night that you use it and you have it, you're, you're like, the man. Yeah. Yeah, and and the rest of the guys in your band are going. Do you have an extra extension cable? Do you have ooh, something ooh, I, I mean, like that? No, yeah. and my guitar works just uh, nice. Like, and and the pedal board that you are using now is is what you got something pretty pretty nice and store bought though, right? I mean, uh, pretty, pretty to, bad. to an extent, yeah. I've had to uh, I've had to augment it a little bit, but it, but hybrid cases out in New York um, does a cool pedal board that's kind of light duty. It, it's it's uh, it's ATA approved, um, <clears throat> but I've had to do things to it to make it a little bit more sturdy and, I, mean, and I, I basically changed the heights of the pedals like I've got one row second row is is up you know about a three quarters inch of plywood on there that's screwed into place and it, it works well in the in the end I mean anybody's pedal board whether whether you make your own or not you know you are custom making your sound your setup yeah. so I mean it's, it's still a very personal experience and it makes it uh, in a weird way it makes it very interesting for all the pedal geeks like me who come to see you know rock shows and have to peek up at the pedals and go oh I like the way that's yeah. laid out and oh he's using this and uh, you know it gives you something to oh guaranteed at any show you can tell who, it gives the, those who guys, the pedal geeks are yeah, who are gives, standing at the stage looking that's why yeah. I keep uh, a little bit of barbed wire around my pedal board <laughs> yeah it gives those guys yeah. something to talk about with me while the other guys in the band are talking to girls <laughs> 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 All right, then, I think on that note, we are going to wrap it up. This has been episode three of the Guitar Shop podcast. I want to thank you all for coming. <laughs>
Uh, Alex Ballard? Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I that was three. Oh, yeah. oh, was it? Okay. Alex Ballard? Dan Hintz, I'm Wade Stark. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, camera Jocelyn. One. And camera two. <laughs> Uh, if you have any questions, comments, anything, uh, you can contact us at uh, Wade's Guitar Shop at sbcglobal.net or you can check out the website, wadesguitarshop.com. Uh, information about the uh, podcast is there. We are going to be back very soon. You guys have any, uh, any closing thoughts? Okay. Or you can call us on Sunday. Uh, between the hours of 6.30 for a.m. and 7 and ask for luck. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we are out here. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of the, the fir- one of the first... Are you okay? <laughs> Keep rolling. This is good. This is, this is normal.